Yo, that's what I'm doing right now. Thank you for joining us again to Guidance to a Good Heart. I am joined by so many panel speakers today. I know it looks kind of large today, but I am glad to be here with so many important people in such a wonderful panel of speakers um, because this is such an amazing topic that we're going to be talking about today. Um, it is um, an amazing and awesome topic. I am so glad to be here with all of you today, not only with um, the amazing guests that we have, all of our guests, um, but before I even start this today, um, let me just welcome all of our Make Station, uh, you know, people who are coming in to listen to us today. Um, don't forget that you can call in at 1-855-493-6499. Uh, remember that uh, today we are talking about not only social changes, but changes that we are trying to um Awareness plus action uh, action equals social change for survivors of domestic violence. We are talking to Amy Ballin, which is a survivor. Uh, not only is she a survivor, but she's somebody who was wrongfully accused of something that, you know, really she was a domestic violence victim herself. You know, not only was she a domestic violence victim, but, you know, she was somebody who has an amazing story that we're going to be listening to today. And before I even begin to even talk about that, I need to introduce my co-host, which you guys see the empty. Look, I have to pull the empty chair. OK, empty chair, empty chair of co-host, empty chair of co-host. OK, see the empty chair, empty chair, co-host, empty chair microphone okay but that's okay we're going to give her a pass <laughs> give thank you give evangelist a Hello, pass everyone. good afternoon so hi evangelist how are you today i'm well thank you how's everyone else i hope everybody's doing well i'm sure that everybody's doing very well did you have a good week I did. It was busy, but it was good. Not complaining. No, right? Um I think we're, you know, approaching that like you know, precipice of the COVID-19 and, you know, we're just, you know, me just meeting the hump, right? I mean, it's like fall. I think we were just talking about it when we were coming here. Um, we're, we're meeting the uh, COVID-19 fall and the hump of the COVID-19, right, Nick? I think we're just there, right? And, uh, you know, we're, we're now starting to, like, cover our mouths more and, you know, starting to utilize, like, this little thing right here, right here, you know, use, <laughs> utilizing more of the little hand sanitizers. But that's okay. I like the little, you know, different little smells of the little hand sanitizers. But anyways, all right, so let's go on in. I'm going to let you kind of bring in our guest. Um, I'm going to let you bring in the first guest, um, and I'm going to let you go ahead and read her little bio. So if you can do that for me, that'd be great. Okay. So our first guest we have is Miss Amy Ballum, and she's a board member of the Domestic Violence Advocacy Center. Amy Ballon is on the board of Domestic Violence Advocacy Center, where she is responsible for social special initiatives. Ballon is a passionate leader to help wrongfully accused victims of criminal justice system, as well as to promote women's empowerment. Ballon, a successful South Florida real estate sales 
and marketing professional is a wrongly accused victim of the criminal justice system and domestic violence survivor. One night, one call caused her life and a career that she had built over 23 years to take a huge turn. Domestic Violence Advocacy Center, a nonprofit organization, works directly with victims of domestic violence. Balan brings awareness to those unable to find their voice to share their truth and innocence. Balan is the recipient of the 2018 People of Distinction Humanitarian Award by Al Cole from CBS Radio and the Male John Woman Award. He has been nominated for a Department of Justice Victim Advocate Award. In addition, she is on the best, she is on the host committee and has raised funds for the Innocence Project of Florida. Ballin, a California native who splits her time between South Florida and Brentwood, California, is also a frequent speaker, has appeared in the media, and is a published author. Her book, Fabulous to Frame, details her wrongful accusation and unjust prosecution for a crime she didn't commit following a domestic violence incident and how she is helping other innocent people from becoming victims of the criminal justice system. In 2014, Ballon's then husband, a former police officer, reached the police first after Amy escaped his grasp and called 911 to tell them she had been beaten. He appeared with a knife wound in his arm and said Amy had stabbed him. The police officers responding to Amy's 911 call believed her then husband and she went to jail. She then embarked on a 16-month journey to reclaim her innocence and another journey just as long to have her name cleared. The success of Violence Company and Project coincided with her fighting for her justice and truth to be heard. She refused to let her wrongful conviction, wrongful accusation define or destroy her despite the reality of the odds being against her. For more information about Ballon or Domestic Violence Advocacy Center, visit www.raisingawarenessfortheinnocent.com. So if you will help me welcome our first guest, Amy Ballon. Yay. Welcome, welcome, Miss welcome. Amy. How are you today? I'm doing thank I'm doing great, thank you, and thank you for having me as uh, a guest on your show as well as well as Don Jackson and Christian. Well, I am so glad to have Christian here as well, which I just want to read just a little bit of your bio, um, which just is amazing. I'd love to be able to just have Christian here. He's a native of Florida. Um, He was born and raised in Palm Beach County. Um, He graduated um, Cardinal uh, Newborn Newman High School. Um, He has been um, a double major in the internal affairs and political science in Florida State University. He earned his Juris Doctrine from Stetson University College of Law, where he was a key member of the um, nationally ranked trial team, served as the president of the Federalist Society. He held positions on the boards of the Hispanic uh, Bar Association and um, he also entertainment and the sports law society. He was a founding member of the student bar associations um, diversity committee and was an active member of the second amendment society and was employed as a teaching Cynthia, assistant for trial. Yeah. You keep um, going oh. like going in and out. Maybe you, am I okay? I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me get a little closer. Oh, okay. Am I? Um, of the Second Amendment and um, was employed as a teaching assistant for the trial advocacy and um, evidence. Um, I am thankful that you're here, um, Christian, and um, thankful that you are able to to be here with us. And also, Don, I'm, I'm thankful that you um, are also here with us. Um, I know that you had done so much um, investigation with what's going on with Amy as well. I'm sorry we weren't able to get your bio as well, but um, I, I can just actually, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself as well, um, that way I don't have to 
you know, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, I would love it so that our our listeners can hear. Yes. Are you ready for me to? to Yes, please. Thank you. I'm a licensed private investigator. Uh, I've been doing police misconduct investigations for about 30 years. Uh, I also do uh, work in the area of computer uh, analysis when people have complaints about issues, which is what, what brought Amy to me. No one would believe her when she said that she was being uh, harassed online in a very unusual way. And ultimately, digging further unraveled some key issues in her case uh, that I'll speak about uh, later. But for now, uh, I'm Amy's investigator. I looked into the matter she's going to be talking about. And I should just say that everything you've said about her in the lead-in is is exactly right. Uh, She is a woman who was started as a victim but didn't end up as a victim. She basically forced change uh, by standing her ground, fighting for what she believed in. And and since she disclosed these issues publicly, it triggered a state law to be changed. And it, it actually resulted in the disillusion of the largest domestic violence health care provider in the country. Yeah. And so I kind of want to start this off because a lot of women are kind of um, facing... Uh, what I call an automaton, what I call titans, um, you know, women um, and not only women, because let's let's be politically correct. Um, women and men are facing, you know, like I said, titans. Um, some of them, you know, may have police officers as, you know, of spouses. Um, some of them may have political representatives or may have somebody that's in the political field. And so um, this is issues that we might have, you know, issues that we might have. And so I want to start off by asking Amy if she can kind of describe a little bit of her story so that we can have a framework of what we're discussing today. Because people are probably going, well, who's this Amy Ballin? you know, lady, and why are we discussing her story here, and why is it so important? So, Amy, tell us a little bit, just, you know, a little bit of synopsis of who you are and why we're here. Okay, so the synopsis would be, as as you said, I'm a victim of domestic violence. It was one night only, and that's all it took, and it was a life-altering moment. Um, My ex-husband, a former cop, had attacked me in an effort to get help. I called the police not aware of mandatory arrest laws, which is part of the Violence Against Women Act. And uh, in calling the police, he knew that one of us would get arrested. So he went ahead and took a knife and stabbed himself and came downstairs saying I did it. And he went outside, met the police, told them that he was a former cop. And at that point, it was all over for me. So I was wrongfully arrested and charged with a second degree felony assault with a deadly weapon. 15 years in prison if convicted and basically I said to my lawyer don't ever offer me a plea I would go to jail I didn't do this and so the good news is at the end of the story because there is a big story with the officer involved domestic violence that's another conversation that I'd like to have for another day because we have Don and Christian here who was who were so important in my second part of my story um in an effort to you know, get my life back. I actually took a job in Sarasota. And right before I took the job in Sarasota to be vice president of the company, in the business I had done for 20 years, after my case was expunged, I moved to Sarasota. My husband, my ex-husband was served with uh, papers, civil lawsuit, and my mugshot started climbing back online. So when I showed up in Sarasota in a place that was three hours from where I lived, The day I moved there, the job got rescinded, and I knew it was because mugshots started going up, even though they knew my story. You know, if you look somebody up, a mugshot, unfortunately, does tell a different story. So that was part of where I started writing the book, Fabulous to Frame, and I decided to get help, and I was introduced to the cyber-stalking expert at the Florida Coalition Against Domestic Violence. That's where Dawn and Christian come in. And in doing so, this man basically preyed on my vulnerability, had access into my computers, and to cover up his behavior... He actually went into my devices and changed content in the narrative to create a story that would work for him. And it was about that time that I called Don Jackson. Um, a letter was sent to the coalition. They terminated the employee that day. But I waited four months and nobody ever reached out to me. So, you know, I filed a lawsuit, called Don Jackson, and I actually 
Christian's law firm was was the firm that handled my lawsuit, and Christian was my angel, truly. I'd say these are two of my angels here. Between Don and Christian, um, you know, I'm very blessed because I don't think I could have gone through it. But I called Don up because I said, Don, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this. It was kind of an interesting phone call. And, and Don, feel free to jump in and Christian you as well because the bigger story, I think, is what we're talking about, which is with the coalitions that are not direct service providers and are there but never offer the help to the, to the victims who need it, which is why there needs to be some social change. And I'm going to let you, Don, on, on that note go because you got the call and Christian got the call around at the same time. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just basically read some of the things Amy said to, to kind of give you an idea of why she needed help. And this was not something that one person could handle on their own. After Amy uh, started seeing her, her photographs appearing online and she got involved with the coalition, uh, Stephen Bradley started basically behaving unprofessionally. And when Amy uh, started reporting it and complaining about it and trying to get the coalition to look into it, there was some very unusual computer activity that told her something was wrong. There were, there were uh, documents that were being altered and they were being switched to essentially remove Bradley from the line of any trouble for, for his activities. Mm. So at that point, uh, what should have happened did not happen. The coalition, which is a state-funded agency, it's a subcontractor to the state of Florida, the Department of Children and Family Services, behaved like a like a rank, uh, I mean, just a worst offender in terms of human resources, how people are supposed to be handled when there's uh, uh, obviously some perhaps a uh, type of crime that took place. His computer should have been seized because... And that's the, where I wanted the, to ask your question. Now... My my question to both you and Christian is that's that's where where my brain kind of when I read the whole story, my brain kind of exploded <laughs> because yeah. don't we usually have to sign a confidentiality form to a nonprofit because they are a nonprofit, correct? And well, don't we have to write a the, the issues the issues with Bradley go in a couple of directions. I'll, I'll get to that issue in a moment. Okay. The most important issue is that a private citizen, a victim, someone who actually came to the coalition to get help, was reporting sexual misconduct yes. by an employee. Right. That prompted what started as an investigation but ultimately went nowhere because as they found more evidence of his misconduct, which included nude photographs, inappropriate statements, a second email account that he was actually using to engage and meet other women. And my investigation found that both he and the coalition lied about his background. They essentially said, oh, this guy's swell. He's a nice guy. He's never had any trouble. But if, if I could, well, I refer to a few things that were, that were evidence we recovered. One of the things I recovered is I went to where this guy worked, which is what you would normally do in any background investigation. Well, if you read the peachy little synopsis that they write about why they were so certain Bradley was a great guy, what's missing is that they didn't do any investigation. They took his word for everything. So if they had gone to the police departments he worked for, which he didn't list in his employment application, he only listed his last law enforcement association, which was the Department of Agriculture. He didn't mix, mention Leon County, Hamilton County. Uh, I'm going to, if, if you won't, don't mind, let me just read something to you briefly uh, from Hamilton County. Stephen provided a very competent interview. He offered thorough answers to each question presented, including strong questions regarding the importance of inclusiveness within the movement. Stephen, Stephen's law enforcement background was evident throughout the interview. He was very precise in the answers he provided. He, he appears to be immensely intense personality, and, the, and he just goes on and on and on. And my point is, had they gone in and checked, they would have found that this guy was fired or forced to resign, that he was caught multiple times at multiple law enforcement agencies uh, engaged in similar misconduct, some of it sexual. And after uh, Christian and Amy get a chance to continue, I'm going to read a short letter that was actually sent to the Leon County Sheriff's Office that I found where someone is accusing him of dating high school girls while he was employed with Hamilton County. 
I suspect that that letter was written by a police officer. Now, the sheriff in Leon County disregarded the letter and brought him in anyway, but lo, just a few years later, he would be fired from Leon County for precisely the kind of behavior described in the letter. And he was never and, charged? And not only that, if you don't mind me jumping in real quick, yeah, I'm on top of all that, but I, just about everything that Don Jackson just mentioned there, uh, is actually available through public records. Uh, right. uh, Florida's got uh, what's called the FDLE, our, our Department of Law Enforcement Agents, where you can get uh, uh, any law enforcement agent's complete background. It's part of our Sunshine Law, which are, are very broad and favorable to public uh, public records laws. Um, that was all uncovered without having to force anybody's hand. All we did was send a letter uh, to the, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Uh, we cited the, the Sunshine Law and the Florida Constitution, and they handed over all of that. So the fact that the coalition would hire him and say, oh, we didn't know anything, shows that either, A, they did know something, or B, their investigation was so disgustingly weak that, you know, we can all just say, well, you should have, if you were acting like a reasonable domestic violence coalition, you should have known. Right. And so they never, they never even charged him at all had it been a good charge. They should have never, they should have charged him to begin with with the issues prior to the issues that he had with Amy Ballin, say they should have been hired. Right. Should never been. been Exactly. They should have contacted each and every one of the girl's parents. That's what I wanted to say. They should have contacted the girl's parents uh, of the charges. And that's what I, what I wanted to ask you, Christian, should they have contacted the parents of said young girls you know, with the sexual assault issues. They they didn't need to because they didn't even take the step that would have allowed them to learn of those issues. All they had to do was say, oh, this guy's a former law enforcement officer. Let's do the very absolute minimum that a business should do when hiring a former law enforcement officer and pull his free public records from the FDLE, the Department of Law Enforcement here. If they would have done that, they would have seen this litany of things. And right. in my opinion, at that point, they don't even have to call any of those people. At right. that point, they should just say, well, we're not going to hire this guy. Right, um, but it, instead, they didn't do that. They ignored all this stuff, and they went ahead and hired him. And all of these public records that are extremely negative and light towards him went completely unnoticed, undetected. And instead, he was hired by a coalition that attempts to prevent or purports to prevent uh, domestic violence in Florida. And and if I could just add one other thing, it wasn't just the coalition's failure. There was a failure of oversight by the state agency responsible for giving them the money that they are supposed to be doling out to women. The state investigation found 1,500 women were turned away while coalition employees were lining their pockets. So there's a whole other level of problems going on in terms of financial misconduct aside from this character who now floats his way into a domestic violence organization. He's writing his own schedule. One of my investigators was just going through the files this morning, and we were looking at places where Stephen Bradley was basically inserting himself everywhere throughout the coalition, places he didn't even belong. Uh, They never really looked at any of his references. They took his his word for, for pretty much everything. And when I say that it wasn't just Bradley, uh, I started contacting the general counsel's office of the Department of Children and Family Services to find out, first of all, did they know about this character? Second, how did he get hired? And third, did they have any policies that would have prevented him from joining the coalition? They basically told me, uh, first they said, we don't know, we'll look into it. Took them a couple of weeks, I kept waiting, so then I started calling back. Finally, they got back to me and they said, well, we've looked into it, and frankly, Mr. Jackson, we don't have any policies that would have stopped Stephen Bradley from having sex with anyone he came in contact with, whether that's a victim, a victim's daughter, a victim's sister. Uh, He was basically wide open because this state organization with a $43 million budget has no non-fraternization policy for its main office. But that wouldn't surprise you when you find out that the CEO is paying herself almost $800,000 a year that she took almost $7 million in packages of uh, things that she was basically grifting, taking money that should have gone to women who would need help and get beds available for women who would need someplace to stay. She padded her pockets, bought bought four four houses, 
one of them is so uh, is in such an exclusive community that the police can't get in there to serve her with a subpoena. So this is this this group of women who are supposed to be helping women were looting this organization while Amy was getting stomped on one side of the organization by a predator because they didn't care. That's not what they were there for. They got into a position where they were making so much money and they were finding so many ways to pad their pockets that the women who were being left out who couldn't find shelter and the women like Amy who were being subject to mistreatment by their employees were irrelevant. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Can I just add to that, Cynthia? So I think it's important to note that, so I gave the, the coalition, now when I first sent the letter and they terminated him upon looking at his devices, we didn't know what they found. Christian and I had no clue for a very long time what they found, we just knew that they terminated him. So when I filed my lawsuit against the coalition, this is how the rest of the story kind of emulator came out. Um, I filed the lawsuit, and in response to my lawsuit, the coalition actually literally victim-blamed me and said I was culpable for allowing negligence into my home. At which point I thought, you know what, as the mother of a daughter, not on my watch, this is not okay, and I went to the Miami Herald with my story. And the Miami Herald was really thrown off by this whole thing. I couldn't believe what they were reading. And then one day, Christian, my lawyer, calls me up and tells me the coalition wants to mediate. So they're about to run my story. And I call the, the, the Miami Herald, and I'm like, please don't run my story. Please don't run my story. They want to mediate. Christian says, Amy, don't let, you know, don't let the story go. And I get an email back that says, Amy, we were able to do a story, but... And, and leave your lawsuit out of it. However, what we were able to uncover by your willingness to come forward and using your voice is the president is making $800,000 a year. And that's the article that prompted what came out two years later. So in the meantime, we have Don Jackson uncovering stuff. We have Christian. I mean, Christian, you can speak to it too. All the things that, you know, you which way you went through with it but it was a willingness to come forward and say you know what i don't care how big they are i'm taking the story and i'm going big because i'm not gonna let this happen to some person who doesn't have a voice and that's what i kind of want to find out because i know this has happened in just florida but i'm trying to find out i'm sure that this is happening in other states and I'm wondering how many states this is happening. And because it's, the coalition is everywhere, you know? I mean, well, There's a lack of regulation, so we really don't know. And no one's... One of the problems with this particular case in the investigation is that there was no incentive to get to the truth. Right. The more truth they found, the worse it got. And the worse it got, the more the liability rose. So their main task from the time that they found new photographs on Stephen Bradley's computer was to just walk away from it. Don't look back. Right. Uh, they didn't turn his computers over to law enforcement. Uh, he was actually wiping the files out while they were sitting there looking at the computer. He's, he's on, I mean, this guy's a computer, uh, a technology expert. He knows I enough to know that. how to do this. So he's now deleting personal accounts as well as, a mixture of personal and business accounts to hide evidence for relationships that he was generating with women who were victims like Amy, who, who were most of them coming through the door like, like Amy was, shell-shocked, confused, demoralized, exhausted, and completely vulnerable. And you've got this guy basically targeting these very women. And it's, it's you know, the coalition's offense, which is their defense, is that Amy is responsible for engaging this character. Well, you know, you don't put that kind of scenario on a doctor or a, a, a psychiatrist or anyone who's in a treatment or care position. It's their responsibility not yes. to mix not to mix business with personal things or yes. not to turn uh, their clients or the victims into their their relationships. This guy was not supposed to even be in a place like this. He could have been at a preschool doing the same thing. Yes. He could have been at high school. And with that, if you don't mind, I just need one minute to just read this letter because I won't may I get another opportunity. 
and it will tell you what what the sheriff of Leon County knew about Stephen Bradley when he was hired. Yeah, I this saw the letter. letter. I saw the letter. So, so please read it. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, can I read it? Yo, yeah, I read the letter. Oh. So please read it. Yes. Okay. Just a moment. Sheriff Campbell, thank you, thank you, thank you. You have been a big relief to the citizens of Hamilton County for hiring Stephen Bradley in your county. You see, he comes on like a ball of fire and will do anything to prove he's one swell fellow. But as time goes on, you'll need to watch him. You see, he took advantage of some of our young girls this, in this county, starting with the high school crowd. Some of them are to blame, as he does look nice in his uniform, and it's easy for young girls to get a crush on the uniform. But as, long, as a law enforcement person, he should know where to draw the line. He keeps a friendly line of communication with the parents while behind their backs, he's messing around with our daughters. Thankfully, one of our parents happened to read her daughter's diary and found out what was going on. Didn't you question why someone with all his certificates and schooling would go from the road force to jail work? Anyway, it goes on, and, and, I, and I don't need to go on reading, but I can tell you essentially what they're telling them is that this guy has a pattern. And this is something Christian said a moment ago, Anybody who had done the most basic background check, if you just called FDLA and said, I got this person who's a citizen law enforcement officer, there's a database. It has all or most of the relevant records. I went specifically to Leon County, but when I got further into the files, it showed that pretty much everywhere he went, he does the same thing. He doesn't know boundaries. He doesn't know how to control himself. He mixes his business uh, professional life with his personal life, and he is a predator he could have wound up in any other job, but the fact that he winds up at a domestic violence uh, service uh, organization is, is really, it's pretty appalling, and it speaks to the state's lack of, of due diligence. Is it, is it possible that he knew someone that worked at the coalition? Uh, you know, honestly, I just think that they were lazy about the things that really matter. Because they were at, at, the, at the time they were bringing on people like Bradley, it was all about putting on a show. They, it was about the look rather than the substance. So the, everything about Bradley is he's a good-looking guy, and he's got the muscle look, and he he's talks. He's got the command presence of a police officer. But the, somebody who ever wrote that letter is a cop. The cops knew what this guy was. Mm -hmm. He was a low life, and he, and, he, and the cops didn't want him to get hired in Leon County. But but in terms of the process, it was flawed because. Um, when you act, it's something that I, I testify with Amy in front of the state legislature, uh, legislature, and what I said to them is, it's like you, they have a lot of talk, right? They say we, the, when you, in fact, I said it on the deposition of Tiffany Carr, the woman who ran the coalition, and I said it on depositions of some of the other employees, and Christian will tell you because he was there. They, they are so smug with their story. They're almost like zombie-like. It's like a cult. They sit down and they say the coalition is the best. I mean, li literally, right to as they were going off the cliff into being dissolved, they were still standing there saying, yes, we're following General Lee right over the hill. We believe, we believe. Well, when I told the state legislature, if anybody actually went in there to do an audit, to look at anything, whether it's their money, their HR practices, their, treat their treatment of women, you would have found scandal here, scandal here, and scandal here. It was a it was a shell of an organization which had simply lost its mission and its leadership was, was looting the organization. So they didn't care about any of these minor details about somebody like Bradley or even what happened to Amy. Amy what they did to Amy was just shameless. They saw another lawsuit coming, so they said, let's get out of this by not doing any investigation, leave Bradley over here, and we'll just keep whistling, hoping that this storm is going to pass. And, and Don, if I can add something on top of that, too, um, you know, one of the most appalling things that, that we realized during the course of that lawsuit was, was, to your point, just how shameless they are about all of this. Um, and this, this goes beyond the the ideas of victim blaming and, you know, the things that you hear in, in a lot of these types of cases where they just they always say, oh, you know, her shirt's too, or her skirt is too short. She was asking for it. And you're just like, that's disgusting. But most people know that's BS, right? The way they did this here was very interesting, but it was coordinated. It wasn't something that Stephen Bradley could have just taken the brunt on for himself. Now, one of the things that, that Don, you had mentioned earlier was about how Stephen Bradley was getting into his own devices associated with work when they were searching him and deleting things. But 
What we learned during that investigation is we don't actually know if Stephen Bradley was doing it. And there's actually a 50-50 chance that it was actually the coalition themselves that once they saw what was on those devices, that they were the ones who wiped it. And the reason we know that is from a deposition of one of the people who was in the room the day they made the decision to terminate Stephen Bradley. And, and this woman, who was essentially Tiffany Carr, the CEO's right-hand woman, uh, her story was fairly fantastic. It, it, was, it was pretty unbelievable in the sense that, oh, nobody saw what was on the phone. We just kind of had it sitting on the table, then we noticed it went black, and then nothing was there. Well, it's like, okay, so when did you notice? Oh, a couple minutes in. So I, had you looked at it? Oh, I, I don't know. And it was a bunch of answers that she had. This, she, you, you could tell she had a story in her head about how this went and how it wasn't their fault, but none of the pieces of the story added up, which, which in my opinion, and again, this isn't something that we had the opportunity to prove. This isn't something that, that I, I don't know based on how far the lawsuit went we could have ever proven. But at least in, in where we are right now, if we could do a little speculating, it's not even that speculative because it's based on a lot of facts and testimony. There is a pretty good chance that the coalition had their hand, their direct hand, without Stephen Bradley's help, in erasing whatever was on that phone and erasing whatever naked pictures they found on that phone, and erasing whatever inappropriate messages they found on that phone. Why? Because Stephen Bradley would have been doing that through an FCADV, Florida Coalition Against Domestic Violence, email address, which would have made them directly culpable as right. their overseer. Because it was their as, IP as address. Speech. It was their IP address, and then it would have made them just as responsible had it been anything that was pedophilia. Or anything what? that had anything to do with uh, s children that was maybe under the age of 18 years old. So if he was taking pictures of, say, small children that was in their shelter, had it been somebody who was maybe 10 years old, 15 years old, 10 years old, or maybe 12 years old, and he was taking small children, and it was their IP address, because we've seen it in the news, um, and we've seen, let's say we've seen it in the news and they've taken all of the hard drive we've seen the whole entire company has been responsible so if it's a whole entire organization and it's their ip address i know this so <laughs> we've seen this if it's a whole entire organization and it's their ip address the whole organization it's responsible for every single child woman who is living in that organization and they have to be responsible for all of the trauma that they have caused them so if they know that and it's it could be their phone too well there, there was no there was never an effort undertaken to find out who these people were uh and right. when you listen to the deposition testimony uh each of these characters essentially waved it off and and said that i i really didn't see that much i just saw a flash of new pictures and then i i turned away quickly and i didn't look back you know who does that but that's what uh, i want to find you, out you i mean that... photos on your daughter's phone or your son's phone or uh somebody at work and you're wondering well, this is work what are you what is that even doing on here but i also want to say uh, to follow up on what christian was saying you can't be sure who deleted what because each one of these characters, when you look at their responses, both in the press and to the uh, questions that were raised during some of these hearings and depositions, the first thing you find out is that they're dishonest. I mean, they're, sure. they're not the kind of people that you would say didn't do it. Uh, because when you could see that they would lie to cover up the financial misconduct, why wouldn't they lie to cover up uh, sexual misconduct involving another employee exactly. under their watch? And that's why, Cynthia, when you talk about these, these titans that, that survivors have to go up against, the Florida Coalition Against Domestic Violence is one of those examples. Yeah. Um, something that we learned during this lawsuit, to, to continue down your, your point of these titans, is the people at the top of the Florida Coalition Against Domestic Violence had ties to very powerful people. Yes. Um, and, and again, this is stuff that it... In civil law, sometimes things aren't directly relevant to your case and you get caught down these rabbit holes. But because we were looking at bigger pictures, I did my best to get down it, but we only had so much leeway. So I don't have a ton of information on that. But what we did learn was that Tiffany Carr, the CEO of the Florida Coalition Against Domestic Violence, had a very peculiar relationship with the woman who was in charge of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And that woman apparently has 
a lot of control over these other state coalitions. Mm. So what it seems like is that these coalitions, and, and you know, it may not be all of them. Heck, it may only be a, a small handful of them. And, and in all reality, that's what we hope it is. But there, we don't know what kind of oversight is over any of these, these coalition centers. We, we don't know who's looking at what. We don't know how many of these people are lining their pockets just like they are in Florida. We don't know how many of these people are taking these positions just to uh, rise in the political uh, environment. We don't know how many of these people are, are taking these positions just to get you know higher paid CEO jobs elsewhere. And that's not what you need in these types of nonprofits. This isn't just a nonprofit to raise some money to, to build homes for people or to raise some money to get homeless people out, out off the streets. This is, this is, these are coalitions to help people who are currently and presently victims and, and who, you know, as domestic violence survivors, I'm, I'm sure you can all attest to the fact that domestic violence survivors, after the fact, they have to be taken care of yes, for I agree. at least a short period of time. They yeah. have to know that people are there for them. Yeah. And if you have people like this who are only out there for themselves, well, they're not helping anybody. I agree. And now that's how you create the titan. You create a titan that's that's a mega, essentially, corporation of wealthy people who don't care about victims. Yeah. And the victims are just le left to, to fight for themselves which is not healthy. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And then that's the problem is that we are going against a, a monolith and then there's victims who are out there calling these numbers, thinking they're getting help, thinking they're getting assistance. They're going out there trying to, like per se, Amy's thinking, well, I'm, I'm getting help. This is a person who's going to help me. This is a person who's, you know, on my side, you know, they're they're here for me. They're here to assist me, and they're they're here for me. There are resources that are here for me, and then we hear it all the time where they're going. They're really not here for me. They're really not. There's nobody here for me, and that's the problem. Is that we hear all the time where there's there's uh, people who are being turned away uh, from shelters or nonprofits. There's shelters who are broken down. There's shelters who um, are broken homes, who have beds, who have crawling roaches. There's uh, shelters who are dirty and have no, you know, these people are making thousands and thousands of dollars. She, Tiffany Carr's making 800, what'd you say, 800 thousand dollars but shelters that are broken down and don't even have good food that have dirty floors that have you know nothing in them but we can provide good sustainability we turn away thousands of people thousands of people per day from homes we turn them away we turn away children literally children from good me, sustainable me, housing say, if i could a part of the coalition's problem was structural as well as the actual behavior and when i say structural they got an unbelievable deal at their at their formation which i think led to many of these problems they were given ex an exclusive contract with the state of florida without having to fight for it without having to prove they were qualified for it, without having to show any real credentials that they would be able to manage a project of this size. So you give, uh, and the budget is actually larger than that because the $43 million is for them to finance and fund things, but they fund, but they get monies from all over the place. And they get it federally and, too. And what we found is that basically no one was really watching because the board of directors were all handpicked by Tiffany Carr. They were friends of hers. So they're looking out for her or not really looking at all because as the questions came up with the chief financial officer and most of these other players, I remember the chief financial officer testified, well, they asked her, well, who, who decides what Tiffany's compensation is? And the woman looked around, looked left and looked right and says, well, Tiffany does. Of course she And does. then they asked, well, who decides what you get? Well, I decide what I get. I mean, they went through a list of them. They were setting their own salaries. I mean, this is this this goes back to 2012 is when they were set up with this unusual deal with the state of Florida. And not to get political, but, you know, when you have connections, these kind of deals happen. And once they got that deal because of their associations, 
no one was willing to ever take a look at them. I know that Amy can't be the first one to have complained. And I can, and I know that some of the shelter managers who saw these bed deficits knew there was a problem and, and reported these problems. And there were people that rushed forward who had been complaining for years. In addition to Amy, there were employees who were complaining. So with this massive problem and all this money being taken out, and I want to reiterate, it wasn't just 800,000. She, they ultimately have tied almost seven to $8 million in money that was routed through a very elaborate scheme where these people were taking time off, paid time off. You know, when they, they were basically claiming work the same way someone would if they were stealing money from workman's comp where they really weren't working or they pretended to be involved in some way with work that would allow them to get compensated when really they shouldn't be paid at all. So to loot an organization that is not just an advocacy group, there's physical space that has to be paid for that women couldn't get because of the money being diverted into this $4 million mansion in North in the hills of North Carolina. You know, there's... Um you know, we're a nonprofit. We are. FFT Helping Others is a nonprofit. And we have to constantly fight for nonprofit money. And it's only larger groups, per se, um, mm-hmm. federal funding that gets the larger amounts. Okay? And so we constantly have to fight against larger groups who, per se, are coalitions that get the bigger funding from federal government. And so when we get phone calls that say, oh, well, they just turned me away because they have no place to place me in the shelter, that's where I have no idea where is this money going. That's what I don't understand. If they're getting millions of dollars, billions of dollars, and maybe evangelists, that, I think that's sometimes where I just... It's, it's going in the people's pockets and, and the sad thing yeah. is just like Amy went there for help that, this is why a lot of women don't go to places for help exactly. because they go there and she was victimized again yeah. as a victim she went to get help they, they, did, they didn't do that exactly. and, and, that's, and that's the sad part about it so why do people take those type of jobs if they're really not in it to help others if your heart is not in it and they're doing it out of self greed, like setting their own pay skills and stuff. Some somebody still should have been over them to check on that. They, I mean, did they file taxes? Somebody had to see some type of documents and papers. Well, that, Every, that, that that's what that, the boss. That's what caused the train wreck. Uh, there was an audit, and they wouldn't give any paperwork to the auditors. They just said no. We're not mm-hmm. giving it to you. So the auditors. Mm-hmm. Told, we're the state of Florida. You have to give it to us. And they said, no, we're not giving it to you. So this went round and round for a while. And then subpoenas started flying. And when the subpoenas started flying, they couldn't find Tiffany Carr. The ones who live here in Florida were, were basically dragged in. Uh, but they didn't have any real answers. And essentially, everybody's saying, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I don't know how it happened. So I, want, I want to touch on this because we're talking a lot about the money. We're talking a lot about the victims not getting help. By the way, it was 18,000 women that did not get the help they needed because of the seven and a half million that was stolen. The sad part about the story is to, to this date today, I have never received an apology from anybody, whether it was the governor, the attorney general. This story would not have happened had I not gone to the, to the Herald. And the only time that the attention was paid to the story was when it was misappropriations of the money. Yeah. That's when the government paid attention. And that, to me, just sends such a message that where's the value in the victims or the survivors, if you will? Where's the value in the person who says, I'm going to put my foot down and as collateral damage, we're going to find out just how egregious this organization is. Yeah. Yeah. Where is the, and I stood in front of the state, the House of Representatives, and I said, I went for help. I blew the whistle. Without me going there, it never would have happened. Yeah, they would have never found out. I mean, they would have never, literally would have never found out that, you know, I mean, I'm looking at the numbers right now. 
you know, and in Florida alone, in Florida alone, you guys start to literally turn away about 32,000 people away from shelters. That's in that's in your state. That's in Florida alone. Hold on, wait a that's minute. that's Hold ridiculous. California minute. alone, 99,000 people. That's domestic violence victims. Well, this, and so I'm trying to figure out where's the coalition doing? <laughs> and this I mean, is honestly they don't they 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 were asked those tough questions by the state legislators and they had no answers. You could watch over three, four to seven days of hearings waiting to get some kind of a, a credible answer. And and these were I mean, with the exception of Tiffany Carr, they have the leadership here. Most of those women still live in Florida. And they came in and they were they didn't look like, you know, sinister figures. They weren't wearing dark hoods or anything. They looked very average. Yeah. But when you heard them talk, you could see that they didn't really know how they ended up there. But I can tell you that looking at organizations uh, that get into this kind of trouble, uh, it starts with mismanagement at the top. And when the board of directors wasn't paying attention and Tiffany Carr, see, basically, here's how it worked. Tiffany Carr knew that they wouldn't tell on her if she gave them some of the same candy. So the people who were around her in a circle all got raises, unexplained raises that jumps from making 50000 a year to making $180,000 a year without any substantial change in the person's education, training, mm-hmm. qualifications. Mm-hmm. How do you explain that? Well, if you put the financial officer in a position where they're beholden to you, they're not going to point out financial problems. So she did this with a bunch of key players she also manipulated the board in a way where she had friends uh, largely occupying the most important seats. So there was no oversight. And the real letdown is the state because why would you subcontract with an organization like this and not be looking out for the citizens of Florida whose right. taxpayer money is funding this entire venture? That's and, and exactly it. The coalition is to help others, yeah. not to take from it. Yeah. Well, and, and that's one, one of the most egregious pieces of this is, you know, we could all be sitting here holding our noses and saying, oh, yes, they were a nonprofit. They, they had a bunch of money and they used it wrongly. Yeah. Fine. But it's a big difference when a huge amount of that money is coming directly from the taxpayers. When yeah. you're there to help the taxpayers, the battered and abused taxpayers. Yes. And then that that makes this hugely different. And. It takes the state so long to to move forward on these allega- on these ver- allegations of wrongdoing that are also backed up by substantial facts. Yeah, I, I and exactly, Chris, and that's what I'm like. I there's facts that are are being so overly looked. I'm like, you are overlooking the facts that you have totally used and manipulated victims here. And you're not doing your job. Uh-oh. You're not doing your job. And so you have used the system for your own benefit. I would, I would just add that the party's not over. Uh, I, I, I see handcuffs in the future for a couple of people. And I'm not saying that flippantly. I really think that <clears throat> when you take that amount of money from this type of organization and you can't account for any of it, and you bought houses and cars and everything else that had nothing to do. I mean, it'd be one thing if they did some big event and maybe spent too much money. But this is money that was completely rerouted solely for individual use that had nothing to do with domestic violence. And um, if, if they didn't have a shortage of beds, I might feel differently about it. <clears throat> but let me also add to this uh, what we've said so far. I did some testing. I used uh, uh, a woman uh, and a transgender tester to make calls to just uh, to see my own little random test to see what happened when, when my testers would call uh, the coalition uh, to say, I need a bed. I need, I need, I, I'm, I'm a woman. I've been hurt. I'm in a domestic violence situation. And aside from being told from time to time that, we, that there were no beds available because we actually ran into that, mm-hmm. the more disturbing thing for me was the circling of the wagons. That like even down to the janitors and the people who did other work, if you called any one of these coalition uh, centers, they all felt the need to cover up for Tiffany Carr. 
It's like all the dominoes fell in one direction. Don't say a word. We're under investigation. And Amy is right. <clears throat> Much of that sentiment was triggered by these news articles. They were being rocked left and right by these massive articles in the Miami Herald and the Tampa Bay Times. So you are, well, and the reason I bring that up is you have to know that it was affecting their work. Yeah. Because we, when I had a person call in to say, can you just give me some advice to tell me what I should do as a survivor? Or can you just tell me what you guys can do for me? They said, no, no, uh, you have to go through an inspection, basically. We don't take any, we don't take any, phone, uh, we don't give any information over the phone. How can you not give any information over the phone when your clientele are battered women who are afraid to even say what happened? So my point is, this this cynical attitude was, which was really largely financial, which triggered the scandal. Also, directly affected the way that the centers themselves were able to interact with the public because everybody was walking on eggshells until the whole thing collapsed. Do you guys, um, and and I will address this to you all, um, do you potentially see this going to maybe the Supreme Court or bringing it to the Senate and maybe the House so that you can have a couple of, of a couple of senators and even the House, you know, speak on this behalf uh, for a couple of the states, you know, so that it can be approached in a different direction because it can't just be one state that maybe has a mandated issue, but maybe bringing it up to the House of Representatives or even the Senate, and then even also bringing it up to the Supreme Court so that it can be brought on to a bigger issue. Do you see that being in the later future do you see that yeah i i do in terms of the house and the senate but um it's i think this is highly unlikely to make it the supreme court um the florida coalition against the states have a lot of freedom with how they use their tax monies yeah uh, even if they are even if they determine internally that they use them improperly i think it's highly improbable that this ever makes it to the the united states supreme court um that may be something more if the national coalition against domestic violence is caught in a similar situation Um, It very well could head to our state Supreme Court. um, But in terms of the House and the Senate, yeah, they could absolutely learn from this. You know, there are going to be various coalitions, whether they're called domestic uh, coalitions against domestic violence or other names that are going to be receiving uh, state taxpayer money in in 49 other states. Yeah. Um, You know, uh, of course, ours. And again, I don't know the other states. Our our situation may or may not be unique in the sense that our uh, Florida Coalition Against Domestic Violence had the monopoly on the taxpayer money. If that's not a unique case, then, yeah, every other state should learn from that. And yeah, our federal legislature should take a, a page from what we've learned and consider making federal guidelines on, on this type of monopolization, or at the very least, if there is this type of monopolization, that you should have uh, adequate oversight for states. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're not just, the, the federal uh, uh, legislatures can't just say, well, the states need to handle this because, well, they're American citizens too, and we can't just have battered women across the country uh, uh, you know, basically like Amy, who are in these horrible situations and they're just very vulnerable and able to be taken advantage of because of the lack of oversight. There's got to be something done about it. Yeah, I agree. And and do you both, I think all of you, do you believe that we need to build some kind of community leadership policy or police kind of some kind of police reform even with some existing ex sheriffs or ex police officers that maybe went through the police force and maybe can handle some kind of situations that has you know maybe will you know go through some police officers you know paperwork or you know look or examine some kind of paperwork or application process before even sending police officers to nonprofits because he was an ex-police officer. So maybe, you know, having some citizens also on that board, uh, maybe citizens or ex-sheriffs or ex-police officers with accommodations that can actually know 
what's happened to Amy's story and even look at Amy's story, you know, do you guys? I can, I can answer that at least partially. Uh, don't worry. We're going to make some noise. Uh, yeah. I'm already in dialogue with some um, law enforcement officials on doing something with this issue by way of training. Yeah. But more importantly, I interviewed uh, Representative Juan Fernandez Barquin uh, a few weeks ago, and right. I don't think the legislation is over because yeah. the coalition found a way to insert itself not in just one law, but there's like 11 laws where they're mentioned in some way. So they passed this law in, uh, in earlier this year, uh, House Bill, I think it was 1037, where they stripped the coalition of its of this relationship with the state. And then that led to the coalition going into receivership and, and folding. But there's more to be done. And there certainly should be something done with regard to background checks yeah. and police officers floating around from private to public, public to private yeah. organizations. Uh, yeah. uh, there should deserve some but much more scrutiny yeah. uh, needs to be found uh, to, to make sure this doesn't happen to anyone else. Yeah. And, and I, I know at least from our state level, something wonderful that, that could be done is is expediting the process to get our public records from our Florida Department of Law Enforcement. I and I know our state has broader public records laws than many of the other 49 states. Uh, and, and we are uh, you know, very grateful for that in, in this case and in many others. Um, but, you know, if if an officer is terminated, uh, from his job for, you know, he's, let's say he's late all the time, or, you know, he, he doesn't do well on his assignments, or maybe he's a bad driver, those kinds of reasons. Yeah, you know, we should treat him like anybody else who gets fired from their jobs for similar reasons. But there should also be sort of a threshold where an officer gets fired for something that would suggest that he could potentially be a danger to the public yes. in any other job, not just as a law enforcement officer, and we should make those records much more accessible. Yeah. Because you don't want to discourage private companies from hiring ex-law enforcement officers. I mean, right. ex-law enforcement officers can be extremely valuable in just about every facet of business, right. you know, based on just their experience, if they're experienced right. enough. Um, but at the same time, you want to make sure that the guys that you're hiring, they weren't fired for being 15 minutes late. Right. You know, if, if they were fired for excessive use of force or in Stephen Bradley's case, uh, beginning a sexual relationship with a woman who was a domestic violence victim while he was in his Leon County Sheriff's uniform and then lying about it under oath, that's something that every business, every potential hirer needs to know. And they need to know it quickly. This, you know, When we request the records, I think it only took a week. But it's also something that, hey, this has to be a part of the process. Yeah, yeah, I agree. There should be some kind of evaluation. And then having certain people, certain leadership, Certain citizens, certain ex sheriffs, certain FBI, somebody FBI, some somebody who's already been retired that knows what that evaluation process looks like, so that it can mandate, you know, through stories of maybe, like I said, Amy's story or somebody who knows what has happened in the past, so that evaluation process can they can know what it looks like. And that way we can have a process system, you know. So, oh, I'm sorry, my phone's ringing, guys. Um, we have a caller. I know that that caller's probably going to. Um, so, um, so it's is that for is that for the station? Okay, sorry, guys. I, somebody's going to ask a question. I just kind of wanted to let you guys know that someone from the station is probably going to ask a question. Um, hello? Oh, it was the front door. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> but sorry, Amy, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you. Go ahead. What I was going to say is, you know, when this was being done, the the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. It's the National Network and Domestic Violence. It's the network out of Washington, D.C. that oversees the coalitions throughout the United States. And when I contacted them to say, well, you're supposed to be, let's say, the, the watchdog on coalitions nationwide, can you help me understand how this could have happened in Florida if it was partly your responsibility to oversee the various coalitions around the United States? 
And they said, oh, we're, we, are, they, we are paid for memberships. And I said, well, wait a second. So did Florida pay a membership to you? Did they pay you to be under your guise, to be part of your organization? And if they did pay you, then how come you were unaware of what they were doing? Right. And, and when I had that conversation with them, they basically said, well, if you want to make a change, go back to Florida, which is what the coalition, what I called the Attorney General, Pam Bondi, and I said, I have a problem with the, yeah, the Florida coalition. She basically told me to go back to the coalition. Well, this was no different. So there's this wall that you have to be able to penetrate. And I've reached out to some really powerful people because I think it's so important that, you know, we do have accessibility to these conversations. How could this happen in Florida? Who was overseeing this? Yeah, exactly. More importantly, back to my point, what about the victims? What about the people? You know, and had I not done this, it never would have come out. Yeah. They'd still be getting their seventy million dollars. By the way, I think it was going to be ninety million this year because wow. they're two years behind. Seventy million. This was the largest privately owned or nonprofit organization in the entire United States, and everybody told me you're not going to make a difference. And I was really, I just said, watch me because. You know, this is just inconceivable what they've got away with. And then, of course, you know, you find one bad egg, and usually you're going to find a few more. And that's what happened in their case with the money. Yeah. And, Amy, I I wanted to, before I wrap up everything, Amy, I really wanted to say thank you for your vulnerability and for giving us an opportunity to have you on the show and for, you know, thank you for letting us have you come on here and for letting everybody hear your story. And Don, thank you so much for giving us your wisdom. Christian, you as well. Um, just your guys' wisdom and your knowledge of, you know, everything that's been going on, not only for Florida, but for everything that um, is going on around the country. Because really, we just don't know if it's just going on in Florida or really all over the United States, really. And this is something that potentially could be going on to lots of other victims. Like I said before, it's really a titan. It's, uh, you know, an automaton. And, and we really don't know if there's other victims out there. And if you are a victim and, you know, you need someone to outreach, um, Don and Christian, is there a way that maybe they can outreach to you or, you know, maybe talk to you if there is a victim out there? Um, do you have a way I, to contact my you? Way, the way to get to me is through the website, policeabuse.com. I run that website, and if someone wants to reach me, they can do so there. And while my focus is largely on police misconduct, as I ended up with Amy, uh, I have clients like her who they just need someone who actually cares about what happened to them. And anyone who contacts me, that they're going to get that at the minimum. Awesome. Awesome. And, and for me, unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a Florida lawyer. Um, I'm not barred in any other state. Um, I am barred in state and federal courts throughout Florida. Um, so if, if you are, whether or not you're in Florida, you can always go to my website. Uh, there's, there's a way to contact me on there. All my information, my email, it's romagueralaw.com, R-O-M-A-G-U-E-R-A law.com. Um, and again, I'm, I'd be happy to talk with anybody who's going through a situation like this as, as an attorney who, who, you know, was the lead counsel and, and throughout Amy's case, um, I think it would greatly help if you're going against a, a, the same or similar organization, um, with the same or similar issues that, that you have somebody who knows how to poke and prod at them. Cause as Amy will know, um, you know, it took, it took some poking and prodding to get even the simplest of documents that we were I'm going to interrupt you, Christian. I was there. Christian is, he's serious. <laughs> no, I, that listen, that, we were laughing at you because, we were impressed. laughing because of, of, because we were laughing at, because he said, Florida, and we're just like, dang it, Florida? <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't just get, just, just come here, Christian, you need to come here. You just need to help us Like I said, here. The, the experience is everything. And, and at the very least, I can help get it going. We can yeah, contact yeah, attorneys exactly. in your state and, and, you know, start the process that way. Yeah, I mean, we, we, need, we need you here, Christian. We need you to fight for us here. We need you here. <laughs> I'll, I'll work on it. Yeah, you need to. Those bar, those bar exams are, are not something I want to continue to take, though. <laughs> I know. I know. I've heard. It's okay, though. It's okay. Seriously? Nick. 
<laughs> I just got hit with the loser game show sound. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I have to say, though, I have the best team for any woman who's a survivor going through anything. John Fastman and Christian Romagara, I could not have survived what I went through without either of them. And they really they took not only a personal interest in me and what I was going through, but more importantly, they cared about the social injustice that yes. they were seeing. And that is the difference between good and great. They are both great. And, and I'm very grateful for both of them. Yeah. A lot of Amy, I'm just thankful for you guys. Listen, I'm thankful for all of you guys. Thank you so much for you guys being here. Um, thank you for our Facebook audience, uh, for you guys listening in. Like I said, um, thank you, Mixed Station. You guys are awesome. Um, this will be on air if you guys want to continue listening. And you guys can find us on YouTube and on all the syndications as well. Um, please do not just listen to our radio station. There are also other ones online as well through MixStation.com. And Evangelist, I miss you. I know. <laughs> We'll be back next show. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you. Okay. So don't forget to watch us next time. Um, not only the, this next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. And so, like always, like I always say, you're beautiful. You are lovely. I love you. And thank God that God loves you too. Bye, guys. See you later. All right. Thank you all. All right. Take care. Bye.